Okay, how many of you have got little ones at home, either your own or grandchildren? Quite a lot of you, I expect. How much effort do you put into getting those little ones to smile? Babies learn to smile at about six weeks old. It's one of the first things they ever learn to do, and it isn't an accident. It's a survival strategy. They absolutely need to get that response from their carers. They need to have that connection. They need to feel that warmth. We have two systems that are about our survival as human beings. One's called the ecosystem, or some commentators call it the ecosystem. And this is the system that is about feelings of belonging, connection. It's the oxytocin that you get when uh, you're together in a comfortable situation with someone. And we know that when little ones, when babies, don't have that important connection with their carers, then their brains don't develop to the optimal level that they have difficulties um, with feeling comfortable about who they are, feeling that other people will respond to them, that the world is a safe place, and that they are worthwhile people in that world. The behaviours connected to those feelings are the ones you might expect, being willing to collaborate with other people, helping, sharing, altruism, and there's a lot around saying how important that individual connection is for the development of altruism, our warmth and concern for other people in our world. We have subjective well-being, and the positive psychology um, journals are full of articles about subjective well-being, how happy I am and how well I'm doing. And it's important to have that hope resilience, and positive ex expectations. But when you feel good about yourself, that's not the only thing that matters. What also matters is that we connect with other people, and not just the people in our immediate worlds, but we recognize that other people are also important. It's what I call inclusive belonging. What happens with, um, in, in a small way when you feel that other people in your world matter is that you will go out of your way to do something for people you don't necessarily know. And here's two little examples of that. One is um, somebody who recognizes that people who've just experienced some sort of trauma um, wouldn't mind um, some free lemonade. It's only a little thing to do, but it's really an important thing that binds and connects us, recognizing that other people have needs. And the other symbol that you can see on the screen is the one for Médecins Sans Frontières. And it's those people who are so tuned in to their shared humanity that other people in their world, even if they don't know those people, have the same needs as they do and they put their lives on the line for those other people. They are full of compassion for them. We have another system that um, is important to all of us, and it exists in all of us, and that's the ego system. It's about um, feeling that you need to feel protected because the world is not necessarily a comfortable and easy place to be. And we know that when we are under threat, or we perceive that threat is going to um, happen to us, then the ego system kicks in. And that ego system is not such good fe feelings. They are feelings of, of fear that other people might have it in for us. Anxiety that other people might have more than we do about mistrust or envy. And those behaviors can lead to us feeling very defensive if we think other people have it in for us. It will also lead to greed, that we want to have perhaps as much as other people, or maybe more than other people. 
it leads to competitiveness. And sometimes it will lead to superiority, that we actually feel that we're, we're better than other people in our world. Unfortunately, what we know is that our society is fostering increasing disconnection between people. Our world is fostering the ego system. Our society is fostering the ego system. What is okay and what I need and just me and mine. And we know that because our world promotes individualism. It's about, to some extent, self-serving relationships. And I expect you've come across youngsters who um, get into a relationship and they are not necessarily thinking about our shared dreams and our shared dis decisions, but about what's in this relationship for me. And we know that we have a huge amount of family and relationship breakdown in our Western world. We know that we've got a great deal of mental health difficulties in our world as well. That one in 10 of our young people have a diagnosed mental health disorder, much of it to do with anxiety. And what's that anxiety to do with it? It's to whether I measure up to other people. Will I fail in comparison? The issue around competition. And what we have when we're all out for something that is about me and mine is that we have reduced empathy in our society, weaker ethics, not doing what's right and decent, but doing what I can get away with. It's what I call exclusive belonging. If you're in my gang, that's fine. If you're not in my gang, then I don't care about you. We have increasing inequality in our world. There's been some great research done by um, um, Felicia Huppert and her colleagues looking at well-being in Europe and looking at overall factors around well-being and finding that the country with the greatest um, level of well-being for everybody is Denmark. And it's quite interesting that in Denmark there is least difference between the haves and the have-nots. Where there is more inequality, there is more overall, there is less overall well-being with, with more inequality. And here's just a few facts and figures from Oxfam that you might be interested in. The world's 85 richest people have the same amount of money as the world's poorest 3.5 billion people. And those rich people are getting richer rapidly. And there's no prizes for guessing what's happening to the poorest. And it's a bit of a concern to me. I mean, how many design addresses can you have in your wardrobe? Do you really think that people admire you and respect you for how much uh, bling you can wear? It's, we are all on this planet for a pretty short period of time. It's gone in a flash. Our lives should not be about how much we can accumulate. We come in here with nothing. We leave with nothing. Our lives need to be about what's meaningful and how much we can give to the world. So what can we do about this? I think, actually, it begins with the messages that we give our children. Not just that they are important and special, because that's critically important, but also that they're not the only ones in the world, and they're not the only ones that matter. Here's a couple of little stories. One is about a friend of mine who was in a, a playground where there was two swings, and one swing was broken, and the other swing had a uh, boy on it being pushed by his dad. And my friend waited until her little girl could have a go, and waited, and waited, and waited, and eventually said, um, excuse me, um, do you think my little girl can have a turn soon? And the dad said, we got here first, we'll be here as long as we like. 
And I thought, well, our kids are getting those sorts of messages. And what are they learning from them? Learning that other people actually don't matter. Now, I was not the world's most perfect parent, far from it. But when my kids were little, I've got a boy and a girl, and they're two years apart. Whenever I bought them an ice cream, I would not buy me one. And the expectation was, is that they give me a lick. And they learned, as soon as they got an ice cream, they didn't even have to ask them. It's just holding it up to mum. <laughs> and it was quite interesting to me to see when they had little friends come over and I bought everybody an ice cream. The little friends who weren't used to that sort of way of being and sharing would scream blue murder if I came anywhere near them. If shared humanity is to matter for the future, and it desperately needs to matter for the future, we need our children to experience that important positive attachment, to know that they matter to the people in their world, and that their needs can be met um, routinely, regularly. But they also need to know they're not the only ones that matter. We need an education system that values the whole child, not just academic outcomes for a few. We need opportunities for children to learn that collaboration and kindness is rewarding, that it makes you feel good about yourself, because that's what the research says. And we also need that they need them to have positive relationships, positive models to copy. Not positive. I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, a bit of work I've been involved with called the Aboriginal Girls Circle. It's uh, a program for young Aboriginal women with the idea that they can be leaders for the future and they can lead some intergeneral intergenerational change. And the program's been running as a pilot program now for about five years and we're hoping to roll it out soon. And it's about promoting connectedness between the girls, but also helping them look at um, what they might do to contribute to their own communities. It's based in a set of principles, but I would actually prefer, rather than spend time on that, to show you um, some of the work that we've been doing. This is a game that the girls have been playing, which is just about connection. They throw um, a, a ball of string to each other, and the idea is that they make a web and if somebody drops that, then it doesn't look the same. They've actually broken the web that they've made together. The message is, is everybody here is important. Everybody matters. And this is what they do when they're looking at what they're going to contribute to their community. It's about what they want their community to look like for the future. What's their ideal vision? And I'm going to show you just a very short clip of Chantelle speaking. She's been one of the girls who's been involved for a while. Girls Circle, a big part of it is helping your community and making it better and helping others. So it's really great for our community to have that, the young people making a difference. It's helped me become more confident and make new friends and make me believe that we can help our community in a very big way. Even if it's just the smallest little thing, it still helps. Everything matters and everything counts. For me, what she's saying is that everything matters, everything counts. The little things matter. The little things that we say to our kids, the little things every day matter in terms not just of their well-being, but what they can contribute and what they understand is their responsibility for contributing for contributing to shared humanity for everybody's future. We need to work together, all of us, to create a kinder world. We have a problem in which our world is becoming less kind than it was. And with that kindness comes universal dignity and also our own professional and personal integrity. I had the um, huge benefit of being in um, London in the summer and went to a proms concert. And in the proms concert uh, I went to, um, it was the Daniel Barenboim's West Eastern Divan Orchestra. And what he, he, it was the most wonderful concert. 
His musicians are made up of Israelis and Palestinians, people who don't necessarily have that sense of shared humanity, not looking at what they have in common as human beings who exist in this world together. But he brought them together to make music. And at the end of the concert, which was just wonderful, um, there were five encores, and at the end, at the end of those, at the fifth encore, it was the end of the evening, and all the musicians stood up and hugged each other. It was a very moving moment. And I thought that I would like to share just the last minute or two of this presentation with Daniel Barenboim and his orchestra. Just listen in. This project that Edward Said and I founded in 1999 has been sometimes described in a very flattering way for us as an orchestra for peace. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. This is not going to bring peace. What it can bring is understanding, the patience, the courage, and the curiosity to listen to the narrative of the other. Everything matters, everything counts, moving towards our shared humanity. Thank you. By the time we're 60, more than 90% of us will have known someone close to us who has suffered from some sort of a neurological disorder. You all know you're not going to live forever. There's only one way into this life and one way out. I cannot prove to you anymore that anything is possible. Talk about the marvelous thing that we now understand about our brains. It gets so much better.